Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you for uh, showing up this morning. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about encryption and authentication with information theoretic security. So the typical examples are the one-time pad for encryption and universal hashing for uh, authentication. Now, the obvious well-known downside of these kinds of schemes is that the key cannot be reused. Right In a one-time pad, you can only use your key once. Well, that's why it's called the one-time pad. And sort of in general, you can only use the key a bounded number of times for these kinds of information theoretic secure schemes. And the reason is quite obvious, at least intuitively. A attacker if can learn information on the key just by observing the cipher text or the authentication tag. So if you reuse the key just by observing the communication, the attacker if will learn more and more information on the key and will eventually know the key. And what's even worse than that, such a passive eavesdropping attack remains undetected, right? There's no way to detect whether <coughs> eavesdropping took place or not. So this means even if I'm not under attack, and so my key would still be perfectly fine to use for a next round, uh, I cannot use it because uh, I don't know. <coughs> so I have to assume the worst, have to throw it away, take a new key. So that's sort of where now the idea of quantum kicks in, or the idea of using a scheme with a quantum ciphertext or quantum authentication tag instead, because there we can make use of the fundamental property of quantum mechanics that any eavesdropping uh, will disturb the state. Right, so this is hope for a scheme that sort of encodes the cipher text or the tag into a quantum state and that we can then check upon arrival if the state is still in good form and if it is, then conclude that no eavesdropping took place and therefore it's safe to reuse the key, right? I mean, if we had such a scheme, this would allow us for unbounded safe reuse of the key as long as we're not under attack. Now, as soon as we are under attack, then Eve may have learned the information on the key, then, uh, well, there's nothing that we can do, then some key refreshing has to take place. <coughs> but the goal is to be able to reuse the key as long as we're not under attack. So if that's the general idea. Now, this idea is not new, it's not new at all. It actually goes back to an old paper by Bennett, Brasser and Breitbart from 1982. So note that even before quantum key distribution was, was uh, proposed, so in their paper, they proposed a simple scheme for this kind of encryption with key recycling and gave very hand-wavy arguments for, for its security. Now, they submitted the paper, but it got rejected. And then they had the idea of doing quantum key distribution instead. And the original idea of encryption with key recycling was abandoned until in 2005, uh, Damgaard, Peterson and Salweil picked up this idea again and proposed a new scheme for, for this kind of encryption with key recycling, but now together with a rigorous security proof. However, their scheme was more complicated than the original scheme. In particular, the quantum encoding was more sophisticated than the, in the original scheme, to the point that in order to actually perform this uh, quantum encoding, you need quantum computing capabilities, meaning for honest users to execute the scheme, well, they need to have a quantum computer. <coughs> so our result is a new scheme uh, a new simple scheme, very much in the spirit of the original scheme by Bennett et al. Uh, in particular, it's based on what we nowadays call BB84 qubits, or simple quantum states that we can deal with uh, 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 with current technology. In particular, no quantum computing is involved. And of course, our scheme comes along with a rigorous security proof as well. I also want to briefly mention a related line of research on encryption and authentication of quantum messages, where the data that you want to protect is a quantum state. So Christopher is going to talk about this kind of, 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 uh, of work uh, in the next presentation here. I just want to mention that some of these schemes also offer some key recycling features, but in all of these schemes, we also have that the honest users need quantum computing capabilities to run the schemes, even if we restrict uh, the messages to be classical in these schemes. Um, okay, so before I go into more details about our result, I want to say a few words about the 
distinction between encryption with key recycling and quantum key distribution. Because, well, we're also going to need quantum communication, so we're in a setting where we can also run quantum key distribution. And you may wonder, why do we even care about reusing keys? Well, if we cannot reuse the key, we could just run quantum key distribution instead to produce a fresh key, right? And I mean, that's true. So from a high level, these two things achieve pretty much the same thing, but there are some subtle technical differences. So for instance, one advantage of encryption with key recycling is that it's essentially non-interactive. Sort of the only interaction necessary is sort of a one-bit feedback where the receiver tells the sender whether the key is still safe or not, whether it can be reused in the next round of, of, of interaction, that, that feedback can be provided uh, offline. Whereas in quantum key distribution, that's inherently interactive during the execution of the scheme. But then on the other hand, because you have this interaction in quantum key distribution, there you can adaptively adjust to the noise that you have in the quantum communication, which is something you can inherently not do in a non-interactive encryption scheme. But, uh, well, independent of these technical differences, my, our main motivation was, was sort of intellectual interest because encryption with key recycling was one of the very first suggestions of using quantum mechanics in the context of crypto. More than 30 years later, there was ne still no really satisfactory solution. Okay. So, in our basic scheme, we're just going to focus on authentication. Right, protecting the message from being modified and so forth. We don't care yet about if learning what the message is. Building encryption on top is then not so hard anymore. And I'll say a few words about that uh, later on. So as you'll see, our scheme is extremely simple. And um, the key, the shared key, consists of two parts, which we call theta and k. And now to authenticate the message m, if not if, sorry, Alice does the following. She chooses a uniformly random bit string x and encodes it into qubits using theta, the first part of the key, as, as basis. So this is just a standard BB84 encoding of classical bits into qubits, which you see in essentially every talk on, on quantum crypto. <coughs> and then she sends these qubits to Bob along with an authentication tag T on the message concatenated with this uh, additional uh, randomness x here. So MAC here is just a standard, classical, one-time secure information theoretic MAC, and I mean they're using the k, the second part of, of their shared key, as, as key of this MAC here. But for concreteness, also because I'm actually going to use certain special properties, uh, let's think of that particular instantiation of such a MAC where the key consists of a random matrix A and the random vector B, and the tag is computed by means of this uh, linear function. It's sort of a canonical choice of such a MAC. Okay. Uh, Bob, well, Bob, he does pretty much the obvious thing. Now, he also knows theta, he knows the basis that was used to encode the bits of x into qubits, so by performing the right measurement, he's able to recover x, and of course, once he has x, uh, and well, the message is signed, uh, sent along here as well, then he can check the correctness of the tag here. That's what he does. And he accepts if the check works out, and he rejects if it doesn't work out. So that's, that's the scheme, extremely simple. Um, so informally, these are the security claims that I make about the scheme. So first of all, the scheme offers authentication security, meaning that Bob is going to detect any modification to the message, and well, that's pretty obvious, that's just sort of the job of, of this Mac here. So this Mac here ensures that any modification in particular to the message here is going to be detected, at least as long as, as sort of this key is sort of good, and it's certainly good sort of at the beginning of time, so to speak. Um, now, the second sort of more interesting claim is that if Bob accepts, then the key can be safely reused for authenticating a second message, a third message, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so even typically, this kind of Mac we can only use once with a given key. Here sort of the statement is, if Bob accepts, then they can actually reuse the same key here in the next round for, for this uh, uh, authentication, for computing this authentication tag here. <coughs> 
And third point, if Bob rejects, well, then some eavesdropping may have taken place. Eve may have learned some information on the key. Then some key refreshing has to take place. And the claim then is it's good enough to refresh theta, but k can still be reused. <coughs> OK. Uh, the intuition behind this key reusing property is, is the following. Now, it's easy to see that if if gets to see well more and more authentication tags for known messages under a fixed key, uh, then she accumulates more and more linear information on the key and will eventually be able to solve it. Right? I mean, that's just sort of the typical argument why you cannot reuse a key uh, 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 for, for such a Mac here, usually. But now here, here the difference is that the authenticated message is partly unknown because we have this additional randomness x here in the message and sort of intuitively because if does not know theta, x is sort of hidden, at least to some extent, behind these qubits for Eve. Huh? So intuitively, uh, uh, we expect that there's some uncertainty in the message x and therefore there is hope that the authentication tag does actually not leak information on the key, in particular if we sort of assume that, well, this, this computation here has some extractor-like properties, and this is actually sort of a function that you would expect to have some extractor-like properties, or actually know that it has some extractor-like properties. And I mean, that's sort of what we're proving in the end, that this is the case. Okay, I think it's going to be insightful before I go into more formal uh, 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 statements to consider a particular attack. And I have here attack in quotation marks because it's not an attack that breaks the scheme. Well, our scheme is, well, proven it's secure. It's just something that Eve can do. And I think it's insightful to see what, what happens under this kind of attack. So here again, I have the scheme as I had it on the previous slide, except that I'm spelling out here the individual qubits that Alice sends to Bob. Now, the attack is as follows. If simply measures the first qubit in the computational basis, so kind of pretending theta 1 was 1, and then she leans back. OK, so let's see what's the effect of that. Well, if the first qubit had been prepared in the computational basis, so theta 1 was 0, then by measuring it in the computational basis, if it's not disturbing the qubit, meaning that Bob will receive the correct state, so everything is going to look OK to him, and he's going to accept. However, if the first qubit had been prepared in the Hadamard basis by Alice, so theta 1 was actually 1, then by measuring it in the computational basis, if is going to disturb this qubit to the point that Bob will recover incorrect x1 with probability 1 half. And in this case, he's going to reject because x is, is authenticated along with the message. So now this means, from Eve's perspective, if Bob rejects, she knows theta 1 must have been 1, right? <clears throat> so she's learned one bit of information on, on the key. Now the bad news for her is that now because Bob has rejected, well, by sort of definition, or by the way the scheme works, uh, uh, they now have to th refresh, or they refresh theta. So the one bit of information she just got on theta becomes useless to her because Bob rejected, so they throw away theta and replace it by a fresh choice anyway. However, if Bob accepts, then, well, theta 1 can still be both, 0 or 1, but it's somewhat biased. It's sort of more likely to be 0, which can quite easily be seen. So also here, Eve has learned some information on, on the key. It's now sort of a constant fraction of a bit of information, if you wish. But now, this key is going to be reused. <coughs> now, intuitively, this should not worry us, or this does not have to worry us, because if Eve tries to gain more and more information on theta by repeating attack, pretty soon she's going to be detected. Pretty soon Bob is going to reject, because every time she launches uh, the attack, Bob is going to reject with probability one quarter. And as soon as he rejects, well, they're throwing away theta, replace it by a fresh choice, so all the information that Eve gained on theta becomes useless to her. 
Okay, um, so why did I discuss this attack? I think this attack shows nicely what we can or more cannot expect to be able to prove formally. <coughs> so it shows that it's not possible to prove a statement of the form if Bob accepts, and then the key remains close to uniformly random. Because we've just seen an attack that sort of contradicts this, that shows that this is not possible. And sort of the insight here is that it may not be necessary for the key to be uniformly random to do its job in this authentication scheme, that it might be good enough to have high enough uncertainty. Indeed, that's what, what, what we show. But I think it's sort of this insight that explains, at least to some extent, why in previous approaches sort of uh, people failed. Uh, because in previous approaches, people tried to prove exactly this statement that after the uh, uh, if Bob accepts, then the key stays close to uniformly random. But if you have a scheme that works qubit twice, then this kind of attack always works and sort of contradicts this statement. Okay, so the formal statement that we prove, slightly informally stated here, is if before the execution we have the following sort of security property on the key, first, the guessing probability on theta from Eve's perspective should be small, and k, the second part of the key, should be close to uniformly random. If this holds before the execution of the, key, of the scheme, then it's also going to hold after the execution of the, of the scheme. Where I take it as understood here that after the execution of the scheme, I'm going to look at theta prime, which is the possibly refreshed version of theta, so it's equal to theta if Bob accepted, and it's freshly chosen otherwise. So we have sort of this invariant that is, is kept alive over, uh, over all execution. In particular, it's ensured that k, the key for the max, stays close to uniformly random and does its job as a key for, uh, for the max. So this means, for instance, we start off with a uniformly random key, then we can keep on reusing it as long as Bob uh, accepts, and we can still keep on reusing it if Bob rejects, if theta part is refreshed. Okay. Um, I'm going to walk you through the easy part of the proof. Um, for that, let's first note that Eve's view after the execution of the scheme consists of her old view before the execution of the scheme, the authentication tag that she observes, uh, uh, whatever quantum information she keeps uh, on the original qubits that Alice sent, and Bob's decision uh, uh, to accept or reject. So then we can spell out the guessing probability after the execution of the scheme uh, like this, and then we can decompose this into the case where Bob rejects and the case where Bob accepts. Then we observe that if Bob rejects, then theta prime is freshly chosen. If he accepts, then theta prime equals theta. But well, for a freshly chosen theta prime, the guessing probability is just one over the number of of possible choices for theta. And here we're using the property of the guessing probability that the guessing probability cannot, in if you condition on an event, the guessing probability cannot increase by more than one over the probability of this event, which is then sort of cancelled out with this probability here. So we end up with this term here. And then we know that by assumption, the key, the authentication key, is close to uniformly random. So A and B are close to uniformly random, which means the T here, the tag, is close to uniformly random, independent of theta. So that doesn't contribute to the guessing probability here. Um, Q, the information that Eve has kept on the original qubits, well, doesn't provide her more information than the original qubits. And here we can observe that X is uniformly random chosen, and therefore these qubits are independent of theta. At first glance, they look dependent on theta because we have theta here in the exponent, but because X is uniformly random, it's a little bit like a one-time path so that removes all dependency from these qubits. Uh, from theta, and so this also doesn't contribute, and we end up with the guessing probability before the execution of the scheme, and so if that was small, uh, then the uh, guessing probability after the execution is small as well. Okay, so that was the easy part. The other part, proving that the other part of the key stays close to uniformly random, is way more involved, and we're building up on, well, techniques from a previous paper. Okay. Uh, so extending this uh, basic scheme to an encryption scheme uh, with key recycling is quite uh, uh, easy. We just use the randomness extractor with a seed that is part of the shared key to extract the randomness from X and use that randomness to, to one-time pad encrypt uh, the message. 
We can also uh, uh, enhance the scheme to take care of noise in the quantum communication. Here, um, <coughs> doing the error correction in a straightforward way uh, brings us into trouble, but there's some nice error correction without leaking partial information techniques by Evgeny and Adam that, that come to the rescue. Um, I want to say sort of just very quickly, what's the trouble with, with error correction? Sort of the obvious solution for doing error correction is just to send the syndrome of X along so that if Bob recovers a noisy version of X, he can recover the right X with the help of this syndrome. <coughs> but the problem is if you then go through this, this uh, analysis that I just did a couple of slides ago, then we get this expression where we now additionally condition on the syndrome here. And now the argument that because x is uniformly random, this does not depend on theta, does not hold anymore, because given the syndrome, x obviously is not uniformly random anymore. <coughs> now, if one sort of meditates over this expression and understands what it captures, it's quite clear that it should still be small, but we have no clue how to prove it. Okay, so in conclusion, what we did is we well, considered one of the very first ideas of, for quantum crypto, one of the very first ideas of using techniques from quantum mechanics to circumvent the classical impossibility result in crypto, an idea that was suggested more than 30 years ago, even before quantum key distribution was invented, and we give the first provably secure solution that doesn't require any quantum computing capabilities. And an intriguing open problem is to do this error correction in a better way. If we could do it in the straightforward, in the obvious way, this would give us not only a nicer, more natural scheme, but would also allow us to tolerate more noise, because these techniques by Evgeny and Adam, they only work for a relatively small amount of noise. And another uh, uh, interesting question or line of uh, uh, direction would be, from a practical perspective, to minimize the amount of quantum communication necessary to make the scheme really competitive with a quantum key distribution. And uh, that concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention. Any quick question? Do you have an intuition why these attacks to quantum money, like Wiesner quantum money, doesn't work here? Because it's the same kind of states that you, like they have there. Um, I don't know what what these attacks are that you're talking about. Maybe we can talk offline. Yes, then, mm -hmm. sure. 